Greetings and welcome to another extensive episode from LinkedIn to Kitifos. My name is George Schmidt and you can find me at the support team of Sophistic where I'm dealing with customers inquiries and working as a consultant engineer on a daily basis. I will be performing to you this video on the topic of the so-called half space analysis. And also I will try to explain how you can set up and perform an analysis within module HASE, which stands for half space advanced solution engine and what I'm going to call as HASE onwards for simplicity reasons. After having introduced to you the theoretical background of the approach, I will give you some guidance about the best practice through well detailed examples in order to reach your goals. At the very beginning of this video, I would like to discuss what kind of possibilities are there to model the static soil structure interaction. Of course, I'm not going to talk about all of them one by one, just wanted to show up the most obvious or well-known ones. One of the possible options to model the static soil structure interaction is to use the so-called Winkler approach, when discrete spring elements are used to represent the soil medium as a system of identical but mutually independent, closely spaced, discrete and linearly elastic springs. As you can also see it in the figure on the left hand side of the slide. One of the main advantages of this approach is that it is very easy to use. Also that it doesn't require explicit discrete modeling of the entire soil with volume elements. Kind of a disadvantage is that the approach is based on the hypothesis of linear elasticity and therefore it cannot handle nonlinear geotechnical problems. According to this idealization, the deformation of the foundation due to the applied loads is confined to the loaded regions only or at least to the vicinity of the loaded regions. But the main disadvantage is the lack of continuity among the springs or in other words the shear deformations within the soil is not considered. The pressure deflection relation at any point within the soil domain is given by P which is equal to K multiplied with W where K is the modulus of the subcrate reaction and W is the deformation. If such a foundation is subjected to a partially distributed surface loading Q, the springs will not be affected beyond the loaded region. By comparing the behavior of a theoretical model and an actual foundation, it can be seen that the Winkler's module essentially suffers from a complete lack of continuity at the supporting soil part. The fundamental problem with the use of this model is to determine the stiffness of the elastic springs used to replace the soil below the foundation. The problem has another aspect as well, since the numerical value of the coefficient of subgrade reaction not only depends on the nature of the subgrade, but also on the dimensions of the loaded area. Since the subgrade stiffness is the only parameter in the Winkler model to idolize the physical behavior of the subsoil, care must be taken to determine it numerically to be able to use it in a practical use case. With the advancement in computation capability, three-dimensional finite element methods have become more appealing as in this method the nonlinearity of the superstructure and the substructure can be taken into consideration more rigorously. In addition, the soil can be modeled as a continuum medium taking into account the damping and inertial effects of the soil. The soil settlements and force demand of the superstructure and substructure can be assessed with this approach as well. Important parameters that are affecting the response between the soil foundation and the superstructure can be investigated. Parameters such as construction phasing, sequential loading, superstructure aspect ratios, soil failure models and thickness proportion of soil field layers can be considered. The greatest disadvantage of this approach however is that computationally it is difficult to carry out full 3D finite element analysis using solid elements for both the superstructure and the subsoil due to the extreme high number of degree of freedom in the system. The 3D finite element approach that is presented in the figure on the left hand side requires a huge number of soil elements which in many cases 
can several times surpass the number of the elements needed for modeling of the superstructure itself, which is usually the main part of the interest for structural engineers. It is therefore very useful to adopt a substructuring technique in which the superstructure will be represented using standard finite elements such as beams, quad elements, cables, trusses and so on, while the soil will be modeled semi-analytically using the half-space theory which is represented in the figure on the right hand side. The connection between the super and the substructure will be assured by flexibility coefficients at the soil structure interface, which will then be inverted to stiffness coefficients. This would then allow a more detailed discretization of the foundation and the structure itself. In other words, the half-space analysis is a semi-analytic method or approach for the description of the subsoil formulated on the basis of a variant of the finite element method. The approach allows the description to be made in a three-dimensional space. It also allows to take into account the angle of propagation of stresses in the ground, so the shear deformations will be considered, a stratification of the ground, and superposition of stress solids of neighboring foundations. The number of the unknowns and the bandwidth of the matrix are small, and this allows the computations to be made on widely accessible hardware of PC class. The foundation of the superstructure, the soil, is assumed to be an isotropic, homogeneous and linearly elastic half-space. The behavior of an elastic half-space is calculated by dividing the surface of the elastic half-space into rectangular regions. These regions are not proper finite elements in the usual sense, even though their behavior is represented by stiffness matrices and they are assembled in exactly the same way as the finite elements of the superstructure. Therefore, they could or might be called as half-space elements. The supporting foundation soil for the superstructure is considered to be an elastic, isotropic and homogeneous semi-infinite continuum with ES and μs values, modulus of elasticity and Poisson's ratio of the soil respectively. The deflection at any point depends not only on the force at the point, but also on the forces at all other points, which is a more realistic approach compared to the Winkler's model. To be able to consider the interaction between the subsoil and the superstructure, some of the generated finite element nodes must act as a very special interface node. These interface nodes will provide the synergy between the superstructure and the half-space subdomain, and they are going to provide it through their stiffness values. But how to assess their stiffness? There are two possible ways of calculating the stiffness values at the interface nodes and assemble the overall stiffness matrix of the subsoil. The first option, or option A, is the stiffness coefficient method. Other technical papers might call it as subgrade reaction modulus method. The second way, or option B, is the so-called method of nonlinear residual force iteration. In other technical papers, this method might also be called as constraint modulus method. First, let me elaborate how to gather the values of the stiffness matrix in the first stiffness coefficient method. To start determining the stiffness matrix of the half space, first the assembly of the flexibility matrix of the half space subsoil must be undertaken. The flexibility coefficient, delta IK, describes the displacement, or with a more accurate wording, the settlement, VI, of point I, due to a unit force, PK, acting on point K in the half space. If we could somehow find the correlation between the applied unit force PK and the settlement at point I, the flexibility matrix could easily be assembled. And as you can see it in the equation system presented in this slide, the inversion of the flexibility matrix gives finally the stiffness matrix of the subsoil.
In order to obtain this correlation between the applied unit load and the settlement of the soil, the following analytical formulas are used in module HASE. Hence the name of the procedure, semi-analytical. The vertical stress, sigma z, in the soil due to the unit load, pk, acting on the surface of the half space, is calculated with a simple formula according to Smolchik and shown in the equation 2.2, 2.3 and 2.4 of the HASE manual describing the vertical pressure trajectories where x, y and z represent the coordinates of the observed point within the half space measured from the location of the load introduction at the half space surface y r equals of the sum of square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The sum of principal stresses sigma p equals sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z is also given by the Businesk equation. There is an important difference between the used formulas of equation 2.2 and 2.3 as follows. Since a direct concentrated load over a finite element node would lead to singularity in the stresses. Therefore, by default, a circular shape distribution area is always applied at the position of the load application. The radius of the circle over the node is determined automatically by summing the fraction of the area of each adjacent quadelement. In other words, the program will calculate the sum of the area of the neighboring quadelements which depends on the meshing around the finite element node, and take a part of this summed area as the load distribution area for the applied load to avoid the stress concentration. If the investigated point I is outside the footprint of the circular formed spread area, a different formula is adopted according to equation 2.3, though the load spread procedure is adapted in the very same manner. The same method can be used to calculate the settlement or the flexibility coefficient delta i k due to the loads acting within the half space, though there is a slight difference in the calculation of the stresses as you can see it in equation 2.5 of the HASE manual. This formula is also according to the above mentioned author and the main difference in this equation compared to the previous ones is that the first quotient which is roughly the same as when the unit load was applied on the surface of the house space, is now multiplied with a factor, which is a function of mu, r, z, and z over bar. For the points in the transition zone, inside of the circular area, but excluding the center point, an interpolation of the formulas 2.2 and 2.3 and 2.4 is applied. The currently presented function itself can be found in the HASA manual as well. When the vertical stresses and or the principal stresses are assessed, then there are two methods available for the computation of the strains and consequently the settlements in module HASA. One of them is the classical method and the other is the method according to Businesk. In the Businesk method, the settlements are determined including an effect of the Poisson's ratio, mu. This method is especially useful for undrained clay with a high Poisson's ratio. Please note that in the Businesk method, the so-called elastic modulus is used, while in the classical approach, the stiffness modulus. Also pay attention to the calculation of the strains, in which, apart from the vertical stresses, sigma z, the sum of the principal stresses sigma p and thus implicitly the horizontal stresses are taken into account. However, since the Poisson's ratio of the soil is hard to define and not a constant value, in most of the practical applications the Poisson's ratio is directly taken into consideration by using the stiffness modulus ES instead of the elasticity modulus E. For the case when mu equals to zero, both moduli are formally identical. If in the properties of the Bohr profile, which I'm going to explain hereafter, there is a positive value given for parameter mu, 
then the businesk method will automatically be triggered internally in module Hase. If the value of mu is set to zero, then the classical approach is launched. Either way, the vertical strains epsilon z can now be obtained by simply dividing the vertical stresses sigma z with the stiffness modulus es layer-wise. And I would like to emphasize that since we can calculate the vertical stress sigma z in any depth of the subsoil, we can divide it with different stiffness moduli according to the depths of the soil layers, since each node at the soil structure interface can have different soil parameters associated to it. This enables module HASE to interpret and utilize a layered half space with soil parameters and layer thickness varying in vertical as well as in the radial direction based upon real bore profile data provided by a geotechnical survey. Finally, by integrating the settlements along the overall depths, the flexibility matrix can be gathered and by inverting it, the stiffness matrix can be provided for the overall equation system. Up to now, only the vertical direction in the half space was detailed, but now let me give some additional information about the horizontal stiffness being considered in the half space analysis. It is now clear that real bore profile data provided by the geotechnical survey shall be used to establish the vertical stiffness of the half space nodes. In addition to the vertical stiffness normally used in the description of the half space, a horizontal stiffness can also be prescribed and stored. This stiffness can be used to describe the horizontal fixities of the structure and must be given if no other horizontal fixities are defined. The horizontal stiffness is determined simply as a proportion of the vertical stiffness. The default value of the horizontal stiffness is specified and stored as 40% of the horizontal stiffness. Vertical walls embedded in the half space are not considered in the assessment of the horizontal stiffness as they are overshadowed for their more important vertical action. Therefore, only the foundation slabs of the superstructure through their friction and the embedded beam elements connected at the interface nodes to the half space domain play an important role of the horizontal stiffness. In the current slide, let me describe the workflow of the soil structure interaction. After having set up the soil profile distribution in plan view, a detailed definition of the bore profiles can commence according to an available geotechnical survey. Based on the previously prescribed half space theory, Module HASE generates the stiffness matrix representing the subsoil part of the static soil structure interaction system. The interaction analysis itself is then performed in module ASE, in which the stiffness matrix of the soil is linked with the superstructure and the response of the entire system is calculated under the prescribed loads. Once the static analysis is finished, module HASE can be utilized once more for post-processing and determining the stresses at settlements of the subsoil due to the supporting forces calculated in the static analysis. It is worth mentioning that it is also possible in module HASE to perform an independent settlement analysis in which the loads are directly employed to the half space. And you might notice that although the underlying mathematical model of the half space theory is based on the hypothesis of linear elasticity, it is still possible to consider optional nonlinear effects at the interface nodes, such as limited stress transfer, reduced pile bearing capacity, and so on. But I would like to underline that inside the half space, the behavior is bound to be linear elastic. In other words, the subsoil domain itself cannot behave in a nonlinear manner. This brings us to the end of the first chapter of this presentation. In the next one, I will talk about soil profiles and their possible interpolations. In this chapter, I will explain how to define and set up soil profiles, how could they be introduced to your model, and finally, what interpolations are available to create the layered half space in your project. Since it is now known from the previous chapter that the vertical sigma z stress could be assessed in any depth of the half space. This enables the procedure to interpret and utilize 
a layered half space with soil parameters and layer thickness varying in vertical as well as in the radial direction based upon real bore profile data. Every single bore profile has different layers and these layers can have different soil parameters associated to them. Let me demonstrate on the next slides what properties can be given within one bore profile. I'm going to present both the graphical and the text-based input practices. With command bore in module aqua, a soil or bore profile is described defining material layers along an axis. Each bullet point of the small screenshot below illustrates how to define the particular types that are properties of the constrained soil modulus for the analysis of settlements or a half-space modeling with module HASE, general description of soil mechanic strata, soil bedding modulus for the pile elements. I'm going to disregard the latter two options since they are not used in the static soil structure interaction. However, I am about to detail the first option in the next slide. As you can see, the soil profile can be given as it were a new material, hence its definition occurs in module aqua, which is also for the generation of materials, cross-sections and workloads. On the left-hand side, you find how can someone create a soil profile for a classic half-space analysis in SSD. First, the number of the soil profile must be entered. Then, an optional title can be added to distinguish the many possible soil profiles in the project. In the forthcoming entry fields, the coordinates and the direction of the bore profile can be established. Please note that with the parameters dx, dy, dz and nx and yNz with the text-based input, an arbitrary direction vector can be assigned to the bore profiles. The corresponding text input can be seen on the right-hand side of the slide. I would like to point out that the items alf, hg, WL and HGWH cannot be used in the static soil structure interaction method, therefore they are not shown in the graphical user interface. Those parameters are for the assessment of the soil bedding modulus for pile elements without the adoption of the half-space technique. On the second tab of the bore profile definition, the soil layers need to be created. The parallel text input of this tab is command B lay in module aqua. First, the ordinates along the profile axis are required in meter unit by default. Then the next input is the stiffness modulus acting from the given ordinate in kilonewton per square meters and valid until the end depth of the current layer, which coincides with the beginning of the forthcoming layer. The type of the stiffness modulus variation within one layer, item vari, in the corresponding text input could be constant with the abbreviation cons or linear with line or parabolic with para. If the value of the parameter vari is chosen to be line, then an increment of the stiffness modulus must be added with the help of item des, which stands for delta es. Additionally, some nonlinear parameters can be defined at the interface nodes, such as maximum pressure at the pile foot with item Pmax, or the maximum lateral pressure with item Pmel, or the cohesion with parameter C. Please note that the parameters phi, gum, and gamma are not yet programmed in the HASE module. And it is worth mentioning one important limitation by the graphical input, that is, only a constant or linear variation of the stiffness modulus is possible to enter. Finally, if you have selected a soil profile or half space analysis according to the Businesk approach, the parameter mu, so the Poisson's ratio, must be entered as a positive value. In the forthcoming slide, I would like to illustrate the functionality of the command belay as follows. The current input case describes the layers of the bore profiles numbered with the variable hash and b, which has three layers specified with command b lay. The first layer is called L1 and it starts at the depth of hash S1 and ends at the next defined depth at hash S2. 
Please note that the parabolic stiffness distribution is assigned to layer L1 with the value of para at item vari. Since there is no explicit stiffness increase defined in the form of a variable hash des1, a continuous distribution can be realized and that also means that the concluding stiffness value will be equal to the commencing stiffness value of the subsequently defined layer in command belay with parameters es and the value of hash es2. In other words, the end stiffness value of layer L1 will be equal to the starting of value of layer L2. The second layer L2 has a linear stiffness distribution which can be realized from the value linear at item vari. This time a variable hash des2 is defined, so the closing stiffness value will be hash es2 plus hash des2. The third layer named L3 has a constant stiffness distribution with value cons at item vari and whose stiffness value is equal with hash es3. The created Bohr profile can be reviewed on the right hand side of the slide. If there is only one layer defined in total along the axis of the Bohr profile, then the ending depth is set at 999 meters by default. If there are more than one layer constructed, then the last layer establishes the ending depth with parameter s, while the other properties or items of this belay command line are ignored. Now let me illustrate the comparable graphical input of this very specific Bohr profile in the next slide. Apart from the stiffness modulus in item ES, all other entries in the BLA record such as items M and O, MU, PMAX, PML, C or Phi are constant within a layer. This is also illustrated in the top right corner of the slide. The stiffness modulus ES and the Poisson's ratio MU can alternatively be set by reference of a material number where corresponding elastic material properties are defined. If within the same belay record the items MNO and ES and or mu are given, then the values prescribed within belay have precedence over those specified by material MNO. In other words, if the user enters a value for item ES and or mu in the belay command, it will override the value predefined in the material references with item MNO. If the Poisson's ratio with the help of parameter mu is defined and larger than zero, then ES is interpreted as the elastic modulus, simply E instead of ES, as you might remember from the previous slides, and the Businesk method is triggered. By default, which means no input is given for items Pmax, Pmel, and C, the nonlinear resistance properties are switched off, meaning that the embedded piles, nodal forces, are not limited, hence the analysis is linear elastic. As in the default case, if the input value of the resistance property is smaller or equal to zero, it will set the contact forces of the embedded piles to be unlimited. Any input value of these resistance properties larger than zero will activate the nonlinearities along the embedded pile element. Let me also give a pair of useful hints as follows. As a prerequisite for a meaningful soil layer interpolation, all defined bore profiles generated with command bore within a grid must have the same number of layers. In other words, the number of layers in the individual bore profiles that is used for an interpolated half space generation must be the same. For example, as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, the number of layers is equal to 6 in every single defined Bohr profile. If this criterion could not be met by the on site geotechnical survey, the user can divide or create new layers of soil with the same properties. For a consistent input of the resistance properties of the soil layers, it is required that within one layer of each of the used bore profiles, the resistance properties be either defined or undefined.
Otherwise, the interpolated properties can have unpredictable values. In other words, the input in which the resistance properties within one layer of some of the Bohr profiles are defined, whereas for the others are not, will most likely yield to undesired results. By interpolating the soil properties and layer thicknesses from the defined Bohr profiles, makes it possible to have different soil parameters associated to every single node at the soil structure interface. There are the following interpolation schemes available. Number one, with the abbreviation CONS, which generates constant soil profile properties at all the points of the half space. Number two, with the abbreviation COOR, which interpolates the Bohr profiles using weight functions. Number three, with the abbreviation LAYR, which interpolates the soil properties from the 3D triangular prism mesh model of the layered half space, defined by the Bohr profile distribution on the half space surface. Now let me give a brief description about the first method. For this type of interpolation, only one Bohr profile will be used for the definition of the entire half space. If the user selects this interpolation method, but forgets to enter the number of the Bohr profile, then the Bohr profile with the smallest number, as defined in module Aqua, will be selected. Similarly, if more than one Bohr profile is defined, with record Bohr, then the Bohr profile with the smallest Bohr profile number will be used. In the second approach, core, vertical soil profiles are defined at coordinates from x1, y1 to xnp, ynp. Next, the soil characteristic of the nodes are calculated as the superposition of all Bohr profile properties C multiplied by a weight factor EP, whose default value is 1.5 but it can be specified explicitly in the record half in module HASA later on. As a rule of thumb, the closer a profile is to an investigated point I, the stronger its influence on a node RI is. With this method, a variable SOAR profile distribution can be implemented quickly without the need for a secondary mesh. The Bohr profile input records can be easily inferred from the building site SOAR report. Minimum two Bohr profiles must be specified with Bohr record. If nothing is specified, all Bohr profiles defined within Aqua are used for the interpolation. The third method, LAYAR, first generates a triangular mesh on the surface of the half space from the defined Bohr profiles, as you can see it in figure A on the left hand side of this slide. Next, this mesh is extruded along the axis of the Bohr profiles to construct a three-dimensional mesh of triangular prisms, defining the discrete soil half-space domain, as you can see this in figure B. In this way, soil properties at the corner nodes of a triangular prism are exactly those defined by the corresponding Bohr and Belay records in module Aqua. Stiffness and resistance properties within a prism are interpolated using hierarchical shape functions, linear in the radial, quadratic in the vertical direction. The variation of the soil properties along the Bohr axis defined in the Belay record is preserved. The geometry of the 3D prism mesh is saved in an additional database with a .cdb extension. The prisms are only used for the interpolation of the defined soil properties. They are not used for the computation of the stiffness matrix of the soil. The stresses and deformations, and therefore the stiffness matrix, is determined using the half-space theory. All the nodes that belong to the structure soil interface, such as the foundation plate or the piles, must be entirely encompassed within the defined half-space domain. In other words, the footprint of the superstructure must be fully within the generated triangular mesh on the surface. Some additional restrictions to this interpolation method that are Minimum three Bohr profiles must be created whose start points describe a convex polygon. For inclined Bohr profiles, an intersection of the sides of the prisms should be avoided. Now let me give some general remarks on the interpolation of the soil profiles. 
When specifying different soil characteristics in the plant view, the number of layers must be the same in all bore profiles. The layer thicknesses can vary, however. The items or parameters ES, mu, Pmax, Pmel, C and V, as well as the layer thicknesses, are then interpolated according to either method 2 or 3. If there is a large difference between the stiffness of two adjacent soil layers, numerical problems may result. Then half-space theory is no longer applicable and an error message is printed. Finally, I am also presenting the limitations of the half-space technique undertaken by Module Hase for your information. In this chapter I would like to introduce to you the first example file, which will be a rough foundation and its variation. Let's start by elaborating the model and its properties in Sophiplus. What you can see at the moment on the screen is the planned view of the structure. So basically we are viewing the structure from the X, Y view. You can also notice that we defined nine structural areas. However, the scope of this example is only the middle structural area. The remaining ones are only dummy structure areas and I will explain a little bit later why I defined them. But first let's have a look at the materials defined in this model file. If we are reviewing the materials on the system tab we will find with number one a structural concrete with the property of C2530. Then below that we can find a reinforcing steel material B500B and finally a third material which is also a concrete material with the classification of C1215. This material will only be used for the dummy structure areas. In this project no cross sections have been defined. But on the other hand we have defined two bore profiles, profile number one and profile number two. First, let's have a look at the position or the location of these bore profiles. The profile number one is located at the bottom left corner of the screen, whereas profile number two can be seen or found on the top right corner of the screen. My idea was to create one bore profile for the classical approach, and the second one is for the Businesk approach to be able to present them in one model file. On the screen, these are just AutoCAD entities, text and circles, with which I only wanted to demonstrate the positions of these bore profiles. Now let's open these bore profiles and see their definitions. For example, if I open profile number one on the general tab, I can set the number of the profile and I can also add a title to it. And in the forthcoming entry fields, the user has the possibility to enter the real position of the bore profiles. On the second tab, we can arrange or set up uh, the layer thicknesses and the corresponding stiffness modulus at the beginning and at the end of the layers. Finally, as the last entry, in this dialog box, one can set the end ordinate of the last soil layer. Please note that in this very first example file, I didn't set up any nonlinear properties such as cohesion or max pressure at the pie foot or max lateral pressure. After having left this dialog box with the OK button, let me show you the profile too. Only the location is different from the first one and on the soil layers the Poisson ratio was entered for every layer but apart from the Poisson's ratio the layer thicknesses and the given elastic moduli are the same as it was in profile 1. In other words in profile 1 and 2 the number of the layers is the same and the stiffness moduli of all the layers are matching with each other. 
Leaving the dialog box by clicking on the OK button, I would like to present the structure from an isometric view to you, just to have a better understanding and feeling of the structure. Now let's review the structure elements, namely the structure areas. If I'm double clicking on the uh, middle structure area, we can read its properties. On the general tab, we will find that I have defined it into group number one and its materials are concrete C2530 and a reinforcing steel B500B. Its meshing was set to a regular grid if it's possible. On the supporting bedding tab, I didn't set anything. On the geometry tab, all the available degree of freedom are set to free, as you can see. On the edges tab, I didn't change anything. Finally, on the loads tab, no element load assignment can be seen or found. Okay, so this is how the definition of the central structural area looks like. Let's leave the dialog box by clicking on the cancel button. Now let me talk a little bit about the surrounding structural areas. If I select any of them, we can have a look at, at their properties. They are all assigned to group number two and their materials are number 11 and two. But what is more important is their thickness, which is set to be one millimeter. The meshing is again set to a regular grid if it's possible. The support or the bedding tab was untouched. On the geometry tab, all of the stiffness properties were unchecked which means that these elements doesn't have any slab stiffness, membrane stiffness or rotational stiffness assigned. So basically with the very thin thickness and with no stiffness at all, they are acting like a sheet of paper or basically a rubber gum sheet. On the edges tab or on the loads tab, I didn't make any change. Basically, this is how these dummy elements were created. And now the question is rising, of course, automatically. What is the purpose of the definition of these dummy area elements? And the answer is as follows. After having calculated the soil structure interaction with the help of module HASE, by post-processing, we would like to get, for example, the bedding stresses within the soil. However, the bedding stresses normally can only be extracted where structural elements are defined. The principal stresses of the subsoil can be shown or presented at any location in the subsoil domain. However, the bedding stresses only below the footprint of the structural areas. And hence, I have generated more structural areas around my main structural area to be able to see the spread of the bedding stress within the soil. If I zoom in a little bit, you will even see that I made a five centimeter gap in between the structural areas, just to make sure that the dummy structural areas are not working together with the main structural area in the middle. After having explained the model structure wise to you, now let's have a look at uh, the loading. So I will just go to the load tab and go to the load case manager and see what load cases I have defined previously. It can be seen that the surface of the structure was applied with a factor of 1.0. And on top of it, I have uh, created or set up Free area load with a magnitude of 200 kN per square meter, which was applied only on a portion of the structural area to induce a non symmetrical loading on the structural area in the middle. Another fact that is worth mentioning that I have set up a cut in the middle of my structural area along the longer edge of the area in order to be able to view the results along this cut in WinGraph later on. 
After having exported the model to SST, the model will look something like this. As an advisable practice to follow, I'm always start creating bore profile plots just to verify the location and the properties of the bore profiles. After having run this interactive graphic using my right mouse button, I can open up the report browser and on the first graphic, the profile designation of profile number one and two will be presented in a plan view just to verify the location of these profiles. Whereas the second graphics tries to represent an isometric view with the designations of profile one and profile two. And on another layer, it also represents the strata of the bore profile stiffness moduli, as you can see at the beginning, 10,000, 40,000 and 80,000 kilonewton per square meter. When the bore profiles have been reviewed and found their definitions proper, the project can be continued in SSD with the definition of the soil structure interaction for load case one with the properties of profile one. By double clicking on the task, a new dialog box will open, which I'm going to explain in detail now. On the first general tab, first we need to select the load cases or the load case to be calculated. Since in our project there is only one load case, load case number one, this is what we are going to execute. Secondly, we need to select the bore profile to work with. In the first soil structure interaction task, I'm going to work with profile number one, whereas in the second one later on in this model, I will use profile two just for comparison. Then we need to select which interpolation method should the software use. If I drop down the list, you will see the already mentioned types such as constant, which needs exactly one bore profile, or the weighted interpolation, at least one bore profile is necessary, or the layered interpolation, which in this dialog box is called soil layers. And as you can see, at least three bore profiles are necessary. In our very first example, we are going to go with the constant. And in the next three entry fields, we first need to define the transverse stiffness in the half space domain. First, we need to enter if we do not accept the default value being equal with 0.40 for the stiffness in the X direction. And similarly, we can enter a stiffness value in the global Y direction if we want to modify the predefined value. Finally, the level of the top of the soil needs to be added. By default, it is set to zero meter. In our case, it is also matching with the level of the definition of the structural areas. So everything is fine in this case. Also, I would like to mention that on the general tab, one can activate the nonlinear effects of the bore profiles, which we are going to do later and not in this very first example file. But instead now, let's have a look at the second tab, the groups tab. Below the groups tab, one can define manually which group to be activated. By default, all the entered groups will be activated. Below the next tab, which is called control parameters, one can control the execution of the soil structure interaction module and maybe choose a different type of solution solver if it is necessary. But normally the default values are OK to be maintained on this tab. Below the next tab, which is called the text output tab, the content and magnitude of the output in report browser can be set like in any other graphical task. And now I'm also going to continue with the default settings in this case. A more interesting tab is the next one, which is called the soil response tab, below which we can control the process processing, namely the evaluation of the soil response. In order to do that, we must select the evaluate soil response option. 
then we need to set up a load case number to store the results in and then we need to set up the depth at which we would like to evaluate the soil response. The depth given in this table is measured relative to the soil surface level and a corresponding result load case number will be set up for each layers. What does it mean exactly? It means that the result load case 8001 will store the soil response evaluated at level 0. Similarly to this, the soil response evaluated at minus 1 meter will be stored in the result load case 8002. The soil response at minus 2 meter will be stored in the result load case number 8003 and so on and so forth. One can add or delete new layers at any time, of course. It is also worth mentioning that one can generate a volume system made out of the half space soil domain, which will be then stored as an additional database with the extension CDB, and the name will be the project name and the suffix underscore brick. One can even control the generation of this volume system in the forthcoming three entry fields. The planar offset of the volume elements can be set in X direction and in Y direction. And the offset is measured both in X and Y direction from the extent of the structural elements. In other words, it means that the offset in the Y and in the X direction will be taken as one meter by default. And so the top surface of this volume system will be a one meter from the extent of the structural elements. These settings can play an important role because maybe it is necessary to evaluate the soil response in the subsoil domain further away from our structure. In this case, you just need to enter the grid offset in X and Y direction in the form of a greater number and the desired results will be available. The minimum grid size is controlling the size of the smallest element in the meshing on the surface of the half space domain. For example, on the screen I am presenting now the contour of this volume model. On the top surface one can see the structural area's footprint and also that the grid offset is set to 1 meter and 1 meter in both of the directions. And now if I select uh, to represent the structure, one can also see that the minimum grid size 1 meter means a 1 meter by 1 meter element, meshing element on the surface of the half space. The only remaining tab that I need to talk about is the one code graphical output. However, it is the same like for any other graphical task. So I'm not going into details. In this particular case, I didn't request any pictures to be stored in the report browser. Okay, now let me leave the dialog box by clicking on the cancel button and show the corresponding text input of this task. After having clicked with my right mouse button, the text editor was open. You might remember from the theoretical part of the webinar to the workflow of the soil structure interaction modules. In it, I mentioned that first module Hase is setting up the analysis. Basically, it assembles the flexibility matrix and invert it to have the stiffness matrix. Then module ASA undertakes the analysis, which means based upon the stiffness matrix, the support condition of the superstructure is now known and a linear or a nonlinear analysis can be performed. Then the post-processing of the results can be done again with module ASA. Now let's go through quickly the commands of the modules, starting with the first ASA module. Between the common head and end commands, we are going to find the first important command, which is the command half. 
which command is creating the half space. In this case, it will create a constant type of half space, meaning that on the basis of the properties of ball profile one, the half space pro properties will be constant in the whole subsoil domain. With the items fuck x and fuck y, the transfer stiffness of the half space can be controlled. With item z, the top level of the half space can be defined. With the command plus and item p max, the bedding pressure for the raft could be controlled if our analysis were nonlinear. However, in this example, we run a linear analysis, so this command doesn't make anything in this case. In the next module in ASA, between the head and end commands, first we are defining a text block with the name of ASA underscore ASA. In it, first we define the type of the analysis with command sysproblina, which means we are going to trigger a linear analysis. Then with the command stacks, the calculated external stiffness matrix will be provided for module ASA from module ASA. After finishing the definition of this text block with hash and def command, right away we are include this text block in this module and then we calculate load case one. In the forthcoming HASA module, we are evaluating the soil response. First, we prescribe which load case we would like to evaluate, in this case all. Then, in the coming lines, with the help of command SELP, which stands for selection of plot representation, we need to define the depth for storing the results. And as you might remember from the graphical task, I had set up levels at 0 meter, minus 1 meter, minus 2 meter, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 35. And of course, we need to store these results in a load case. So if I scroll down, you will find again the command SELP, but now with the item LCST, which stands for load case storage 8001 which means that the evaluated soil response will be stored from load case 8001. Finally, again with the help of command SELP and item BRICK, we are setting up a new database to generate the volume system. And the items DX and DY define the grid offsets in global X and global Y direction whereas with item h min we can set up the minimum grid size. Okay, now let's get quickly run the first soil structure interaction of load case 1 by right click on it and choose to calculate just to demonstrate how fast it is and also to show you in the calculation protocol the generation of the stiffness matrix in the first HASA module. Then if we scroll down, we will see the ASA run with load case 1, as you can see on the screen. And finally, the evaluation of the soil response again with the next module HASA. To illustrate the results in a faster pace, I have already set up interactive graphics. And by opening the first one, we will see the bedding stress along the depth of bore profile number one. Maybe I am going to present the graphics by the page width. So what we can see on the right hand side of the screen now is the bedding stress at level zero stored in load case 8001. What you might notice is the maximum bedding pressure is around minus 460 kilonewton per square meter. But we can also find positive values which means that the bedding pressure is actually a bedding tension, which of course could not be the case in reality. However, since we had run a linear analysis, the nonlinear bedding properties were not utilized. So the value of the bedding in this case could be negative and positive as well. If I click on the second graphics, 
then the bedding stresses at level minus one meter will be presented. At level minus one meter, the maximum bedding pressure is only about minus 130 kilonewton per square meter, and also the maximum tension reduced. And of course, if, if we go deeper in depth, the bedding pressure will decrease. And finally, at the last level, which is around minus 35 meter, as far as I remember, the bedding stress is only minus one kilonewton per square meter. And now I, I would like to point out once more the reason of the definition of these dummy structural areas around the middle structural area, which is that in this case, the spread or the propagation of the bedding stress in the subsoil in the adjacent areas can be very nicely seen. If these dummy structure areas had not been defined, then we could only see the bedding stresses below the main structure area in the middle. Now let us continue with the next interactive graphic, which will show the stress, the bedding stress along the cut, which I had defined in Sophie Plus. And it goes through in the middle of the main structure area, representing the bedding stress of load case 8001 at the depth of level zero meter. As you can see, the maximum value in the middle of the slab is only minus 270 kilonewton per square meter, because now we are further away from the corner of the area where the maximum value was minus 470 kilonewton per square meter. Okay, my next illustration of the results will be a stress cut through the soil volume elements, which means I have created in module wing, a new graphic in which I used the project name underscore brick.cdb, which stores the volumetric model of the subsoil domain. And if we open it in the report browser, the graphic shows two pictures from which the first one is a stress cut in the global X direction of load case one and representing the stress in the global Z direction in the nodes of the subsoil. Whereas the second one shows also the stresses in the global Z direction in the nodes of load case one, but in this case in the global Y direction and with a different representation type. Coming back to SSD, you can see that I have created a second soil structure interaction of load case one, but in this case, now it is based on profile number two, which was set up based on the Businesk approach. So when I open up the dialog box, the only difference in the input is that I have selected profile two to be used as a constant type of generation of the half space. Apart from that, every other input is exactly the same. Leaving the dialog box by clicking on the cancel button, I am going to quickly uh, run the second soil structure interaction module. And in this case, I would like to open up its report browser file because after running the first soil structure interaction task, I simply forgot to present what's inside in it. I have already presented the input data, so let's get over to the system and control information. It shows the used bore profiles with its number and its location. We can also have an information about the soil profile interpolation, which is in this case a constant profile everywhere. In the half space table, we can see that the subsoil domain is going to be created according to the Businesk approach where the elasticity modulus equals with the stiffness modulus. And the deformations are calculated considering the Poisson's ratio in the equation. Furthermore, we can even see the number of layers in the bore profile, then the top level of the half space being equal with zero meter. Then comes the information about the minimum load radius, 
which describes a circular shaped distribution area that is always applied at the position of the load application. In the next line, the beam load radius also describes a circular shaped spread area, but in this case it is considered for the interface nodes within the half space domain, for example, when there are pile elements or beam elements in the soil. On the right hand side for these radii, you can see the default values. Then the stiffness factors in the transfers global X and global Y direction are presented with the value of 0 0.40 and also in the global Z direction with a factor of 1.0. Then there are some general information about the number of the nodes and the quads are listed. Finally, the maximum bedding stress in case of a nonlinear analysis below the raft foundation is presented. Then in the output of module ASA, we will see the used load case, the exact loads on the structural area, then the sum of all the loadings, and finally the sum of all reactions. What is more interesting is the evaluation of the soil response, again in module ASA, which reports that the results of the volume elements are saved in the additional project name underscore brick.cdb and also gives information about the half space stresses in deeper layers and their load case numbers. Okay, now after having introduced to you the output of the second soil structure interaction task, according to the Businesk approach, let's compare the results in the interactive graphics. Coming back to SSD, I'm going to represent the bedding stresses along the depths, but in this case with the help of profile number two. And if I click on the first layer, we are also going to find the very same value like with poor profile one, though the maximum value is a little bit higher. However, going deeper, the difference is getting uh, smaller and smaller in between the two poor profile types. Okay, now let's have a look at the bedding stress in the cut of load case 1, calculated from poor profile number 2. In it, I can see a little bit of increase when I'm looking at the peak value. When we looked at the very same result from the classical approach, it was about 275 kilonewton per square meter. But to have a better overview about the results, I made a comparison interactive graphic. And I would like to demonstrate it to you now. I'm opening the difference of the bedding stresses and click on the first layer. And with the help of WinGraph, I can compare two load cases which I did for a load case 9001 and 8001 at the first place. And we can see on the right hand side that basically the difference between the bedding stresses between the two approach, the Businesk and the classical, is only 43 kN per square meter at the maximum value. Then as we go deeper and deeper in the layers, you can see that this difference is start to decrease and then it actually disappears totally. Okay, with this information I would like to conclude this example file in which I wanted to represent a single structure, a raft foundation on the ground, with some dummy area elements defined around it, just to be able to see the bedding stresses at a greater extent. And then I represented how the soil structure interaction task is working with the classical approach and also with the Businesk approach. And that such an analysis can even be performed in the very same model. Okay, now I would like to continue with the variant of this model. And with the help of the video editing, now I'm in the first variant of the very same model. Yes, you can see it correctly. Everything is the same. The only difference from the previous main model is that I'm going to analyze the soil structure interaction in a different way. If I'm opening up the first task, the first soil structure interaction task, 
you will notice one important difference, namely that in this case I'm going to calculate the half space with the nonlinear bedding effects for the raft and pies considered. And for that reason, I set the number of iteration to 100 and the maximum bedding pressure for the rafts being e equal with 300 kN per square meter. Now let's check its corresponding text input. I will simply click on the cancel button and open up the text editor by choosing it from the drop down list. What you need to notice is that in this case there is an additional command line starting with control, I mean with command CTRL and the item solve and non. This very command line will trigger the second type of the half space generation which was mentioned in the theory part as method of nonlinear residual force iteration. What does it mean exactly? It is a little bit of difficult to explain easily because this method differs from a common finite element nonlinear iteration where a nonlinear answer of the element force to a given displacement can be used directly. Because here in the half space analysis it is necessary at the end of each iteration to guarantee that the half space displacements correspond to the nonlinear reduced contact forces. For example, in this example, we are limiting the bedding pressure under the raft uh, with a value of 300 kN per square meter. And somehow, at the end of uh, each iteration, we must make sure that the displacements in the half space domain correspond to this nonlinear limiting force. Do not forget in this space, in this half space, a reduction or limitation of a force in one contact node causes a change in all other half space nodes. So in order to uh, preserve uh, the global relationship between the interface nodes, the reduced contact force vector is multiplied with the half space flexibility matrix and this will give a displacement vector. If we compare this displacement vector with the actual finite element displacements, we can extract uh, correction forces from the difference between those two vectors. I mean the displacement vector of the reduced contact forces to the finite element displacement vector. And of course, after several iterations when these correction forces are very small or negligible then the iteration will stop. A huge advantage of this method is that the flexibility matrix doesn't need to be inverted at all. In case of a complex model with lots of nodes and finite elements this method runs through much faster than the normal stiffness coefficient method. This command then needs to go hand in hand in module AZ with the stacks command with the items nonl1, which will build up or handle the half space stiffness in an iterative way. The analysis undertaken with the method of nonlinear residual force iteration doesn't necessarily need to be nonlinear. This means that in this command line after the command syst, item prop can be also linear. The online help of this command stacks will also elaborate it a little bit better. As you can see, as in the first option, with the command syst prop linear can be used together with stacks. In this case, a linear analysis with full condition stiffness matrix will be used and it is useful for small systems. In the second option, we still undertake a syst prob linear analysis, so a linear analysis, but in this case we insert stacks, so the external stiffness matrix with opt iter. This will trigger a linear iterative analysis, which can be used for big systems. In this analysis, only one load case in one ASA module is a load. And in this analysis, no nonlinear effects are taken into account. 
in the third option with command sysprob nonle, a nonlinear analysis will be executed together with command stacks opt iter in which the nonlinear properties will be considered. Let me point out one more interesting thing that could be misleading or disturbing. In the text input on the left hand side, we can read stacks non1, whereas in the manual we can see stacks opt iter. Actually, the parameters non1 has the very same effect as the parameters opt iter as it is described a little bit above in the manual. Okay, now having explained the method of nonlinear residual force iteration, as you can see, this variant is only differs in the method of the analysis and the given limiting force under the raft foundation, but other than that, everything is the same compared to the previous example. So now let's compare the results. I already run the analysis, so if I'm opening up the bedding stress along the depth of the profile number one, we will see that on the zero level, the maximum bedding pressure is equal with 300 kilopascal, which was according to our expectations, of course. And what is important to notice is that in this case, we cannot see those tension forces in the bedding meaning that our analysis was really a nonlinear one because there are only compression bedding forces here. If we click through the bedding stress diagrams along the depths of the bore profile, we can see how the stress disperse is changing along the depth. Now let's have a look at the bedding stress in the cut from load case one, as we did also in the original example file. And of course, now we are going to find that the maximum bedding stress is equal with 300 kilonewton per square meter as the limiting value was set in our analysis. But what is also important to notice is that this diagram goes down to zero and there is no positive part of this diagram. Moving on to the second soil structure interaction of load case two created by profile number two. One can see that this is also a nonlinear analysis undertaken with 100 number of iteration and with a maximum bedding pressure for the rough foundation equal with 300 kilopascal. Do not forget that the aim of the second soil structure interaction analysis was to see how the results are different if we undertake the analysis according to Businesk. So let's see now, I have already run the tasks, so I'm just presenting the report of the bedding stress along the depths of profile number two. And of course, on level zero, we will also find the maximum value being equal with the limiting 300 kilopascal. And also there is no tension bedding stress visible under the raft foundation. And along the depth, we can see the different values of the bedding stress. But what is more important to investigate is the difference of the bedding stresses between the two approaches, meaning the classical and the Blusinesk approach. And if we look at the results in the report browser, we will find that the round down of the stresses is a little bit different from the previous example file, in which the maximum of the difference was around 40 kilopascal. And also the diagrams show the different scheme when we went through the depth. Okay, this concludes the first variant of the first example file, but let me demonstrate a second variant of it. In this second variant, as you can see, what I left out is the surrounding dummy structural areas around our main structural area in the middle. But apart from that, Every geometry input, every profile input, and every loading input is the same as it was in the very first example file. Having exported this variant to the CDB and opening up the soil structure interaction, what we will find is that it is also a nonlinear analysis 
based upon 100 iteration and on a maximum bedding pressure for the raft with 300 kilopascal. But what is different from the very first example file is that under the soil response tab, I have changed the grid offset in the global X and Y direction to be equal with 6 and 6 meters. Because with these two input lines, the surface of the half space can be offset by 6 meter by 6 meters. So basically the extent of my volume system will be exactly the same as it was in the first example file. And again, this volume system will be saved or stored in the project file underscore brick.cdb file. Having run the analysis and looking at the report file, we will find that the bedding tracks diagram looks a little bit different, even at level zero meter. Of course, the 300 kilopascal limiting bedding stress will be kept and there will be no tension bedding stress under the rough foundation. But as we click through the diagrams, you can see that the bedding stress will only be available under the raft foundation. So now you might understand why I created those dummy rubber gum sheets around the central structural area. The bedding stress in the cut from load case one will show the exactly the same shape and values like we saw in the second variant. What is more important to illustrate, I believe, is the stress cut through the soil volume elements, because in it we can see the real extent of the volume element system. The central area with the dimension of 10 meter by 5 meter can be seen in the middle of the top surface. However, with the 6 meter by 6 meter offset, the extent of the top, top surface is exactly the same as it was in the very first example file. So what is important to remember from this is that if you need the stresses in the subsoil domain further away from your structure, then you need to adjust the grid of the offset in X and Y direction accordingly. Okay, this concludes the explanation of the second variant of the first example file. Finally, let me show you the third variant of it. In the third variant, only the middle structure area is defined. In this model, however, I have defined four bore profiles. Their location is clearly presented on the screen at the moment. I will be presented the layers of the bore profile in an interactive graphic after having exported the model to the database. But first let me mention the loading of the system, which is exactly the same as it was in the very first example file. Now going back to SSD and show the report of the interactive graphic of the bore profiles. On the first picture, we can see the location of profile one, two, three, and four. And in the second picture, we can see the bore profile values and the number of the layers. Please notice that all of the bore profiles have three layers. Even the value of the subgrade moduli are the same. However, the layer thicknesses are a little bit different from each other, which can be seen in this diagram as well. The reason why I created the bore profile in this way is that in this example file, I would like to perform a layered interpolation with command layr. So let's go back to SSD and see how we can achieve this. If I open up the soil structure interaction task, in the select bore profile part, I have selected all the profiles and for the bore profile interpolation method, I have chosen the soil layers interpolation method. Please note that the interpolated soil volume system will be stored in a separate database with the name of project name underscore layer dot cdb. This should also be a nonlinear analysis with the very same settings as before. And if I quickly run it, I will be able to represent it to you, this additional CDB. By opening the project folder from SSD, 
a new or additional CDB can be seen in the tree and by simply double clicking on it the animator will be open and the interpolated layers or the interpolated volume soil system will be visible and we can see how the interpolation was executed. If you remember from the theoretical part, first a triangular mesh on the surface of the hull space from the defined bore profiles will be generated and it can be very nicely seen that from four bore profiles the triangulation has been done and two triangles has been generated. One can even select this triangle by clicking on it, for example like this, and then this triangular shape will be extruded along the bore profile. This is how the soil volume system is generated. Please note that the number of the layers in each of the bore profiles is equal with three, and internally these three layers were subdivided into two parts. So the interpolation can only happen if the number of the layers is the same in every bore profile. Going back to SSD, I'm not going over the results that we saw previously in the previous variants. Instead, I would like to point out that it is also possible to represent the interpolated soil volume system in the form of an interactive graphic. This is what I have just done here and if I'm opening the report of it, you will see that basically with the help of WinGraph or Graphic, a very nice picture about the interpolation of the soil layers can be created or generated. Okay, this concludes the third variant of the first example file and now I'm starting off with the second example. In this chapter I would like to introduce to you the second example which will be about modeling a combined pile raft foundation. Let's start it by explaining the theoretical background in a nutshell. Generally piles can be embedded in the soil domain and through their nodes they interact with the half space. The introduction of the load to the half space is carried out by using the equation 2.5 also presented previously in the theoretical part, but can be seen in this slide too. There are two possible ways to model the load introduction in the form of pile elements in the half space analysis, namely as internal half space piles or extended piles. In case of the internal half space piles, the elements are not discretized in the finite element system. They are just a property or attribute of the half space domain and can be defined with the help of command pile in module HASE. But of course it is also possible to define them in SOFI Plus graphically as you can see it on the screen right now. Under the register tab called half space pile via the definition of a structural point, the most important properties of the pile can be prescribed. This type of pile is included as part of the calculation of the stiffness matrix at the half space surface. In a linear calculation, it is assumed that by default, the half of the total pile load is transferred via screen friction and the rest as point pressure at the foot of the pile. Of course, it can be controlled via item month in the record pile. The part of the loading that is resisted by screen friction is evenly distributed over the length of the pile relative to the soil stiffness along the pile and integrated numerically. I'm not going to detail this approach furthermore since the usage of the extended piles gives more possibility, freedom and control over the piles themselves in the system. So, in contrast to the first option, Using extended piles in a system means that real meshed beam elements need to be defined below the half space surface. With the help of command group in module HASE, the beam groups can be selected, whose stiffness values should be calculated within the half space. In comparison to the functionality of the internal half space piles, which condenses the total effect of the pile to a single stiffness at the point where the pile is attached to the superstructure, 
each node along an extended pile element represents explicit degree of freedom within the half space. This allows the bedding effect to be represented continuously along the pile. The effective soil stiffness properties along the extended piles are always determined from the half space stiffness defined by the bore profiles. If additional nonlinear resistance effects along the extended piles are to be considered, it can be done via interpolating of the nonlinear resistance properties from the corresponding soil parameters of the defined bore profile distribution. The length of the piles within the half space, the pile diameter, and pile circumference are automatically taken into consideration for the evaluation of the specific values of the extended piles. The nonlinear resistance properties of the extended piles that can be assessed in this way are the maximum pressure at the pile foot, maximum lateral pressure, and the cohesion. The corresponding items in command B lay are P max, P mal, and C, respectively. Currently on the screen you can see the second example file, which is going to be a combined pile raft foundation with nine extended piles defined in the half space domain. In this particular case, I have defined the materials, the cross section and the bore profiles via text input. When I open the text editor, you will see that I started to work in module Aqua and between the framing head and end commands I have started with the command control rest 2 which keeps the current values in the database if there is any. With this command line I can avoid deleting the database upon a new run of this text task. With command norm, I selected the code for this particular project, which is Eurocode 1992-2004, without any national annex, as you can see at item count. Then I prescribed the materials, namely the concrete material with the classification of C30, and the reinforcing steel material with the classification of B500B. Then I quickly defined some variables that I'm going to use later on in the definition of the bore profiles. First, I have created a variable D with a value of 0 0.80, which is going to be the diameter of the piles. In variable R, I have defined the pile radius. In variable U, I prescribed the perimeter or circumference of the pile. In variable area I prescribed the area of the pile element. Below that I was generating the two bore profiles number one and two with their exact location given with items x, y and z and with their inclinations with items nx and y and nz. Both of the bore profiles are 30 meter deep which can be seen from the last given belay command line. And it can be also noticed that both of the bore profiles have three layers altogether. The stiffness moduli are identical for both of the bore profiles, as you can see on the screen. A difference has been only created with the nonlinear properties, such as the cohesion, the maximum pressure at the pile foot, as well as the maximum lateral pressure of the piles. The values for these nonlinear items were defined in such a way that I used the circumference or perimeter of the pile element, the area element of the pile element, and the diameter of the pile element respectively, and divided an explicit value with these parameters in order to get easily verified numbers at the post-processing. Please remember that the length, the perimeter and the diameter of the pile element will be considered automatically from the definition of the cross-section 
and the geometry of the system. After having finished with the definition of the code, the materials and the bore profiles, the only remaining thing that I had to define was the cross-section. With the help of command SCIT, I generated a standard circular shaped cross-section with some minimum amount of reinforcement. The planar extent of the model is 27 meter in the global x direction and also 27 meter in the negative y direction. All of the pile elements are 16.8 meter long. The distance between the pile elements is 9 meter in the global x and in the global y direction as well. The edge distance of the piles is 4.5 meter in both of the directions. And the thickness of all the structural areas is 1 meter exactly. The uniformly distributed load applied in load case 1, which is the only load case in the, in the system, was calculated or prescribed in such a way to cause exactly 50,000 kilonewton overall vertical load in the system. The effort mentioned attributes were assigned to the AutoCAD entities in SOFIPLUS and the model was exported to the database for the analysis of the soil structure interaction. But before we jump into that, let me present the bore profile plots that I had set up for this specific project as well. By opening up its report, the location of profile number 1 and profile number 2 is represented in top view, just to be better oriented. Then in the next graphic, the strata of the bore profile stiffness moduli can be seen. And also it can be very nicely seen from this picture that the bore profiles themselves are longer than the pile elements. Since the bottom of the last layer in the bore profile was set to minus 30 meter. This picture also very nicely illustrates that the location of profile number one exactly coincides with the location of the middle pile of the first row. Similarly, the location of profile number two coincides with the location of the pile element in the middle of the last row. I did this intentionally because in the soil structure interaction task I'm going to set up a weighted interpolation between the values of profile 1 and profile 2. However, since the location of profile number 1 and 2 is exactly at the middle pies, it will be uh, easy to verify the nonlinear results at the middle pies later on. In the forthcoming picture we can see the maximum pressure at the pile foot in kilopascal. Then in the next one the maximum lateral pressure is presented also in kilopascal. Whereas in the last one one can see the cohesion along the bore profiles in kilopascal. Coming back to SSD, I take the advantage of using the text input and I define the soil structure interaction task in the form of a text input, as you can see it in the screen. First, a linear analysis will be performed in the HASE in order to create the stiffness matrix or the stiffness values for the linear analysis with the help of module HASE. Let's go through the major commands of this module HASE. First, with the help of command half and the item type coor, I was setting up the half space according to the weighted interpolation with item type coor. The transfer stiffness of the half space was set with a factor of 1.0 in the global x and in the global y direction as well. The zero level of the half space was set to 0, 0.0 meter. For the weighted interpolation, I used bore profile number 1 and 2. Then with the command line plus Pmax 300, I prescribed the maximum bedding pressure for the raft. 
Then in the forthcoming lines with command group, I activated the groups in the system, namely group number one, which is for the raft foundation and group number two, which is for the piles in the half space domain. Please notice that beside the common items of command group, in the Hase module, we have a possibility to set up special properties with the help of item food, for example, or with the item CC. If I open up the online help, we can see these extra items such as food, RC and CC. With the item food, one can simulate the effect of additional stiffness at the pile foot. With a positive value, a diameter can be defined explicitly assigned to the pile element. However, alternatively, it can also be defined with a factor of the original diameter at the bottom end of the pile element. In this case, the input needs to be added with a negative sign. For example, in my input, foot minus 1.4 means that the original diameter of 0.8 meter will be multiplied with 1.4 and be used to assess the maximum pressure under the pile foot, mimicking the effects of the additional stiffness. With item CC in common group, one can set up the contact circumference for the nonlinear skin friction for the pile elements. By default, the software will try to use the diameter read out from the cross section. However, it is not satisfactory for the user. It is possible to revise this value here with this item. After having set up the help space within module HASA, module HASA starts to work. In the forthcoming command lines, one can see that it is a linear type of analysis and that the external stiffness will be used in an iterative way. In this other module, load case 1 will be calculated. Finally, we are going to evaluate the soil response again in module HASA at a different level of depth, starting from 1 meter to minus 30 meter and storing the result in a load case starting from 8001 till 8008. Finally, we generate a volume system with a grid offset of 1 meter by 1 meter to be able to represent additional results if needed. After having set up the linear analysis, I have just created a new text task for the nonlinear analysis. Please note that in this nonlinear task, we do not need to redefine the half space. It's already stored in the database and available for us. So we simply continue with the analysis of a load case one in a nonlinear manner. And this is exactly what I defined with the help of command syst prob nonal and just added some items how many iterations I would like to perform and also I set up a tolerance value for the nonlinear analysis. The handling of the external stiffness is also iterative in this case. To be able to distinguish between the linear and the nonlinear results, I created load case 11 into which I copied the loads of load case 1. The evaluation of the soil response is almost the same as in the linear analysis. The only difference is that the storing load case was starting from 9001 till 9008. Again, just to be able to distinguish between the nonlinear results from the linear ones. After having run the linear and the nonlinear analysis, I'm going to present the results in the form of interactive plots. In the first picture, I wanted to illustrate the bedding stress of the raft, as well as the normal force diagram of the beam elements. First from the linear analysis of load case 1, then from the nonlinear analysis. Please notice that although the sum of the loading in load case 1 and in load case 11 is exactly the same, the disperse of the sum of the reaction is different from load case 1 to 11. In the nonlinear analysis, the bedding stress of the raft increased 
and simultaneously the beam normal forces were decreased. In the next picture I am presenting the nodal support force at the node of the pile element. And also I have split the nine piles into three rows from the left to the right. One can see this is the first row of piles, the middle row of piles and finally the third row of piles. At the bottommost nodes the pile food forces are presented. And again first in the linear case of load case 1, then in the nonlinear case of load case 11. If I switch back and forth between the linear and the nonlinear case, we can see that there is a slight increase in the pi food force from the linear case to the nonlinear one. In the final two picture, I was presenting the pi axial bedding force from the linear case and again from the nonlinear one. And in this diagram, I would like to point out the middle row of the piles, because in it we can very nicely see the limiting values of the nonlinear cohesion along the pile elements. Going back to the definition of the Bohr profiles, we can see the limiting values being equal with 20, 50, and 80 kilonewton per square meter, respectively, in Bohr profile number one, whereas in Bohr profile number two, we can see 10, 20, and 40. And really in the results of the nonlinear analysis, we can find these values 10, 20, and 40 kilopascal, and also the 20, 50, and 80 respectively. Please also note that due to the weighted interpolation, these values cannot be met on the pile elements at the very edge, for example because the interpolation was not a constant one. But how the interpolation of the Bohr profile values will affect the results? This is exactly what we are going to find out together in the variant of this very same example file. Before I elaborate the first variant of the second example file, I would like to discuss and clarify the different type of interactions between the combined pi raft foundation and the half space. In the current slide, the four considered interactions are presented, namely the pi to soil interaction in point number one, the pi to pile interaction in point number two, the raft to soil interaction in point number three, and finally the pi to raft interaction in point number four. Along the outermost surface of the piles there is no other interaction than the pure interface connection between the nodes of the piles and the half space domain. This effect is illustrated with point number one in the bottom figure on the right hand side. If the piles are close enough to each other, one pile will interact with the other piles in its vicinity. This impact on the pile is illustrated with point number two and this is what I am about to demonstrate in the next variant of the second example file very soon. The most obvious interaction is the rough to soil interaction, marked as number 3 in the figure, in which the interface nodes on the half space surface are directly influencing the stresses below the raft. Finally, the pile to raft interaction, marked as number 4 in the figure, the impact of the stresses induced by the rough to the soil domain is considered at the interface nodes of the pile elements. So, the total resistance of the combined pile raft foundation can be determined as the resistance of the raft plus the sum of the resistance of all the piles, where the resistance of one individual pile contains two different types of resistances, namely the screen friction and the point pressure at the pile foot. The skin fiction is integrated numerically over the length of the pile considering its perimeter. The point pressure at the pile foot is calculated also by integrating the stresses over the area of the pile cross section. So in the first variant of the second example file, 
I will be using exactly the same model. The materials, the cross sections, the bore profiles are exactly the same. The only difference that I undertook was in the generation of the half space, where as you can see, instead of the type coor, I used now the type cons which means that the half space is going to be created according to the constant type. And since I haven't prescribed any explicit input regarding the number of the bore profile to be used, the one with the smallest number defined will be used. However, if we are not sure about this, we can simply comment out bore profile number two, or after having run the task, we can have a look at the report where we will find that profile number one was used. Going back to SSD, I have run through the linear analysis and the nonlinear analysis as well. And now it's time to compare the results of this variant with the previous one. By opening up the result plots with the help of the report browser, we will see the very same graphics as in the previous variant. And what I want to demonstrate here can be very nicely seen or found even in the very first picture, namely the interaction between the piles within the half space. Let's have a closer look at the pile forces, the normal force in the pile elements. And we will find even in load case one that the normal force in the pile element on the very edge is minus 760 kilonewton. If we now review the middle pile of the first row from the left side, we will find that the normal force in this particular pile is minus 843 kilonewton. This is an increase of roughly 85 kilonewton from the edge pile. If we now review the absolute center pile of this three by three pile arrangement, we can read the normal force value within this pile element as minus 928 kilonewton. And it is also an additional 85 kilonewton increase compared to the previous pile that we investigated. So, what we can see is basically the pile elements are not interacting with each other. So in other words, this three by three pile arrangement or layout doesn't allow the pile to pile interaction to be developed. And for me, it seems to be reasonable since the distance between the pile elements is 9.0 meter. They are quite a distance from each other. In the next variant of this example file, I'm going to use a 5x5 five five layout of the piles, where the distance between the pile will be reduced to 4.5 meter. In other words, the distance will be halved between the piles. But before we jump into the next variant, as an additional information to this second variant, I would like to present the pile axial bedding force from the nonlinear run. And I'd like to point out that since we were using one bore profile and the constant interpolation, the same limiting value of the cohesion can be seen on every pile element, namely the value of bore profile one, which was 20, 50 and 80 kilonewton per meter. To be able to better and faster illustrate the difference between the first variant and the second variant of the second example file, I've just created an additional slide in my PowerPoint presentation. And as you can see, the only difference in the second variant compared to the previous one is that the raster or the distribution of the piles has been changed from three by three to five by five. But all other properties, such as the materials, geometry and loading, are exactly the same. So the expectation of the second variant is that, due to the reduced distance between the piles, the interaction from one pile to the other 
will be more significant in this second variant. But let's see and have a look at the report. So now I'm presenting the second variant of the second example file. I have already run the linear and the nonlinear analysis. And by opening up the report file, you will see that I have created new pictures. And in the picture, you can see the first line of the piles, the second line of the piles, and the middle line of the piles from the left of the raft. And it is also important to mention, to better understand these graphics, that only the very last segment of the pile elements is being presented. Otherwise, the diagram would be too messy. Okay, now first review the first line of the piles. In the previous variant, the smallest normal force in the pile element was in the very edge pile. However, as you can see, now the highest value being equal with 561 kilonewton acting on the edge pile and slightly decreasing towards the middle piles. Also, when we are reviewing the results within the piles towards the center, we can read slightly decreasing values. However, it was absolutely in the other way around in the previous variant of this example file. And this phenomena is due to the pi to pi interaction which can be very nicely illustrated through the normal force of the piles, since the distance between the piles are halved now. All right, with this information, I would like to conclude the second variant of this example file and also the presentation of the examples. And now I would like to answer some of the most frequently asked questions about the functionality of module HASE. From a computation time point of view, does it make sense to use module HASA for a global analysis approach too? For example, would it be simpler and quicker to model the rough foundation of a newly designed bridge and its abutment using spring elements for the global analysis, and then perform an other verification type of analysis using another local model and perform it with module HASA? In the past, I used module HASA for a global model analysis and it created a very large CDB file, and it also took quite a long time to process. Well, I think your suggested workflow is optimal. I would create two separate models, one for the global detailed analysis of the superstructure, and a simplified one for investigating the substructure with the soil interaction. This would be the quickest way, in my opinion. Maybe up to around 2000 contact nodes defined on the surface of the half space, the global model could also be analyzed in one general model within reasonable time. I have realized that the use of kinematic constraints or couplings would cause any half space analysis crashing when the elements of the half space domain are in contact with the constraints. Is there any way around this issue when analyzing an abutment, for example, foundation with piles? Yes, it is true, it is not allowed to use kinematic couplings in the soil domain. I suggest connecting the beam elements with the raft directly. Or, alternatively, you could use a hinge at the end of the beam elements, where it connects to the raft. Why is the default value for items FOC X and FOC Y, describing the lateral stiffness of the half space, equals to 0.4 in command half? It is a value based on experience from sophistic use cases. The application of a horizontal load differs from a vertical load in real circumstances, since the vertical pressure is also present when the vertical load is implemented. Hence, the friction is different for the two types of loading. And this is what sophistic try to consider in the factor being equal with 0.4. There isn't any literature about this number, but sophistic authors think using a factor of 1.0 would be too stiff for the horizontal effects. How are the pile elements modeled in SOFIPLUS when the direct method is required? Does sophistic use standard beam elements in that case? How does sophistic know that it is a pile element rather than a normal beam? Do you have to activate it as a pile or what? How to set an inclined pile and its properties, lateral stiffness, etc. 
if the term direct method refers to omitting the half space technique, then what you need to do is to assigning the bore profile properties to the beam element. From the assignment, the software will know that the element is a pile and not a normal beam. According to the properties of the bore profile, the bedding attributes will be assigned to the beam and used further in a normal analysis, excluding the half space approach. It can be undertaken both in SOFIPLUS by selecting the variable bedding option or via text input. This type of bore profile is different from what I had shown for the half space technique. It is generated with the help of command bore, BBX and BBLA in module Aqua, where the lateral stiffness can be prescribed with item BBLA. Can you please show an example or provide some guidelines for a rough foundation having different levels? For example, a building with a basement spreading under only half of the ground floor. How to set a zero level in this case? Does the stiffness matrix allow a load transfer from the upper rough to vertical walls of the deeper part of the building, or should it be modeled in a traditional way using external loads? One of the official example files called hase 3 underscore variable underscore surface underscore level dot dot deals with this issue, which I am going to explain now. It is possible to consider the horizontal quad elements below the level of the half space surface with the help of command half zvar auto. In this case, the theory of the half space analysis is no longer valid because the stiffness of the quad elements changes the stiffness matrix of the half space. But still, this type of analysis delivers great advantages compared to simply using bedding properties for quads. The reason behind is that in case of variable Z level, when a load is applied on a foundation slab at level, for example, minus 4 meter, triggers settlement in a neighboring foundation slab defined at minus 8 meter. One more important hint. According to the figure in the next slide, a spread of shallow is assumed in module Hase that deactivates the possible connection nodes of the quad elements above the lower foundation slab. The same answer could be given for the next question, which is The example presented for the foundation plate was made on a flat ground surface. What happens if the ground surface is inclined so the foundation plate must have two or more height levels? Does the same theoretical principle still work, or is there any other approach to consider? If there are no shadowed connection nodes, then all foundation slabs work as if they were lying on the top of the half space surface. In the presented picture, the top level of the half space was defined with red, therefore the abutments at the middle and on the right hand side are within the soil domain. The second example with piles were calculated on vertical loading. How does the horizontal load effect acting on the system based on the half space theory? In the case of horizontal loads acting on the half space nodes, the procedure is the same as it was explained in the first part of the video, meaning that the same stiffness matrix is being used during the analysis that had been calculated for the vertical loads. This is just an approximation, which in most of the cases delivers good results though. However, if you have important horizontal loads, where this type of loading is the most relevant or decisive, then you might consider using real volume brick elements to build up your subsoil with special geotechnical properties. From the available different type of interactions such as pile to soil, pile to pile, rough to soil or pile to rough, only one of the approaches of the interaction could be considered or is it possible to combine two or maybe all of them in one calculation? All the interaction types are considered at the same time without the need of any extra input. In my presentation I just extracted one of those interactions, namely the pi to pi one, which is an important one and can easily be illustrated. I was wondering how the skin friction is calculated for the extended pies. I don't see a relation with the vertical or horizontal stiffness matrix. Or is there no deformation skin friction relation? I think what you are referring to in this question is the impact of the skin friction on the settlements. 
In this regard, there is no deformation skin friction relation considered in the half space theory. The part of the loading that is resisted by skin friction is evenly distributed over the length of the pile relative to the soil stiffness along the pile and integrated numerically. Where in the calculation is the cohesion used? Is this an input parameter to determine the friction or is it used anywhere else? The same question applies for the friction angle. The value of the cohesion is used in the calculation of the skin friction of the pile element. In the combined pile raft foundation example, one part of the pile resistance or pile strength was derived from the skin friction evaluated along the length of the pile. The friction angle cannot be considered in the half space analysis at the current status of the software. In order to grant the friction angle, item V in common belay, the assessment of the horizontal pressure would be necessary. However, up to now it hasn't been developed. In case of running a nonlinear Hase followed by a linear Aze, the stiffness matrix is calculated based on the residual force iteration. However, the nonlinear properties such as Pmax or Pml of the bore profile are neglected in the calculation of stresses. Now I am wondering how do we deal with the results of the Aze, especially the nonlinear Aze, in which we have eliminated the soil tension. You mentioned we cannot combine them for a maxima superposition, so how do we proceed with the design of piles or the raft? Is there a specific procedure for that? In the linear Aze run, the material properties are considered in a linear manner and no nonlinear attributes are taken into account for the piles. Regarding the second part of the question, the same guidelines and rules are applicable as in a normal nonlinear analysis of a superstructure only, meaning that the theory of superpositioning cannot be applied. You must create a new load case or many new load cases into which you copy in the loads of the single load cases and you perform the nonlinear analysis within ASA based upon these newly created load cases. Then the design of the elements in the system can be undertaken with the results of the nonlinear analysis. How do we deal with the existence of water at the foundation level? The existence of the groundwater level cannot be considered in the half space analysis at all. The semi analytical formulas in equation 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4 that had been shown in the presentation to calculate the sigma z stress are established based upon the assumption that there is no water present in the soil. What happens if a plate is loaded above the maximum soil capacity? and the forces are distributed in such a way that the entire soil area below the plate experiences its soil capacity? Will the soil experience any form of plastic deformations? If the loading on the plate is so high that the underlying soil layer right below the plate is going beyond their capacity, prescribed with the value of command plus Pmax in module Hase, the deformations will increase and you will find no equilibrium. So the distribution of the stresses occurs automatically. Plastic deformation in the classical geotechnical sense, following different types of material laws, is beyond the capabilities of the half space method. The underlying mathematical model is based on the hypothesis of linear elasticity. In other words, the subsoil domain itself cannot behave in a nonlinear manner. In case the load is just as high as the input with command plus Pmax, the soil stress will be the same as if you applied a constant free load without slab stiffness on the surface of the theoretical half space. Are the friction angle, unit weight and the high low groundwater level planned to be included in the module in the future? If so, approximately when? And will there be any soil models included to calculate the soil failure mechanisms? The implementation of the friction angle, unit weight and the high low groundwater level is not on the top of the new feature list. They are not expected to be developed in the near future.
The soil models that are capable of following soil mechanics cannot be implemented in the half-space analysis due to the underlying hypothesis. However, you can use Sophistic's tunneling or soil mechanics features using bricks, for example with graphical input in Windtube. Is it possible using module Hase in a dynamic setting, where for instance the contact area between the plate and the soil medium is changing over time? Generally speaking, the contact area, or with other words, the found contact nodes below the plate is always the same. It will not be changed over time. You can use an ASA time step analysis with linear half space. Personally, I haven't tested yet if the analysis run in a nonlinear manner. My assumption is that such an analysis would fail. I wonder how the analysis should be formulated in case of analysis of load combinations created by Maxima. For example, for a bridge with many load cases, including traffic loads from load stepping. In case of a linear analysis, you can simply use module Maxima and superimpose the actions to obtain the most severe internal forces of the elements in the system. Then you need to trace back the load cases causing these effects. If the contributing load cases and their factors are known, then you have to set up a new load case or many load cases into which you copy over the loads of the contributing cases. Finally, you need to perform the half-space analysis on the newly created load case or cases. In some norms, such as the German one, the horizontal bedding of piles is limited against the earth pressure at the rest situation. Can this somehow be considered in the calculation with the Hase module? And if not, can this be adopted by another module? A limiting value of the lateral pressure for the pies can be given with the help of item PML in common bore. However, this value is an explicit value entered by the user and it is always remains the same during the analysis. It might be adopted in module Talpa. Is it possible to influence the generation of the prismatic mesh between the soil profiles? For example, if I want to prescribe a certain direction for the interpolation. No, the prismatic mesh generation on the surface of the half space is automatic and it cannot be controlled. If you want to influence the way of the interpolation, you might try to use the weighted interpolation method item type core in command half. Is it possible to take into account parameters like unloading, reloading, pre and or overburden pressures in the half space analysis? A loading, reloading or a pre or overburden pressure cannot be specified in module Hase. As its name tries to reflect, the method used in module Hase is based on a semi-analytical static soil approach and not on a geotechnical one. The soil mechanics in the half space technique cannot fully be handled. Sophistic has a special module for the soil mechanics related problems called TALPA. Are there any recommended limitations for the dimensions in X, Y and Z directions defining coordinates for the bore profiles? According to my experience, the numerical results are dependent on the depth values and they also vary very often when the existing bore profiles lay in the area of the foundation plate, but not outside of it. How should the engineer proceed in this case? There is no specific limitation for the dimensions of the X, Y and Z. As a rule of thumb, the footprint of the bore profiles in the global X, Y horizontal plane must encompass the foundation plate fully. The depth of the half space should be deep enough to contain the bottom node of the longest pile, but of course the ideal if it is even deeper. What is the procedure to model the half space for the underground structures? Should the bore profile be defined from Z equals to zero and the top level of the half space from Z equals to depth of the foundation? How to consider the soil pressure on the corresponding underground walls in case it is a Kellergeschoss, meaning basement? I believe the bore profile should really be defined according to the existing geotechnical survey. 
For example, if the level of the site boring starts at plus one meter, then the bore profile should be defined from plus one meter two in the project. The top surface of the house space should be defined at the real depth of the foundation slab, for example, at minus one meter. The corresponding soil pressure on the underground walls can be considered only in the form of explicitly given horizontal loads acting on the quad elements of the wall. The horizontal earth pressure on the underground walls must be added manually by the user too. As mentioned in this video, one has to be careful of understanding the difference between the elasticity modulus E and the stiffness modulus ES. The first one is used in the Businesque method and the second one in the classical approach. Can you please elaborate more on this? What is the difference between them? What is the value provided typically in the geotechnical report? When a specimen can freely deform in any direction under the applied vertical pressure, then the ratio of the vertical pressure and the vertical deformation will provide the so-called elasticity modulus E. Whereas, if the deformation of the specimen laterally is constrained, then the ratio of the vertical pressure and the vertical deformation will provide the stiffness modulus ES, as it is illustrated in the figure. The value typically provided in the geotechnical report is the stiffness modulus. In the first example, the interface between the slab and the half space happened at level 0 meter. However, on site the slab has its own real thickness, therefore the half space should start at a lower level. Can this be somehow specified in any manner? Yes, of course it can be. The slab can be defined with eccentricity. More information on how to define shell elements with eccentricity can be found in the Sophiemesh C or in the Sophiemesh A manual. However, we usually do not consider this bottom slab effect. Is it possible to define friction coefficient at the half space nodes? Does the half space resist horizontal loads? I'm thinking, for example, if it were possible to model a retaining wall where the horizontal forces are resisted by friction. Only the skin friction of the piles along their mantle can be defined with item C in command bore. But sure, yes, the half space resists horizontal loads, otherwise the system would not be stable. Retaining walls must be analyzed with module Talpa as 2D plane structures or with module Hase as three-dimensional volume element systems. You mentioned that defining the value of mu greater than zero triggers the Businesque approach. Is this mu specified in command belay? Yes, exactly, the value of item mu is specified in command belay of module Hase. Can excavation be modeled within module Hase? I mean, extraction of soil with the corresponding relaxation of the underlying soil. No, unfortunately it cannot be. The elastic half space doesn't have any memory in terms of loading history. So the effects of the construction stages cannot be considered in the elastic subspace. It remains elastic and no primary loading storage can happen. Please use module Talpa for this type of analysis. After having compared the results of module Hase with other software, it has been noticed that the half space analysis doesn't capture the load confinement effect under a load, which being introduced to a confined part of the whole base lab, and hence it leads to quite a substantial overestimation of the settlements under the particular loading. Can you please provide an explanation on this? The underlying theory of module Hase doesn't explicitly consider a load confinement effect under the load. However, you can control the results with altering the default value of the load radius in command lower with item R. The used value for all the nodes of the house space in the current system is always printed out in the report as minimum load radius. If it doesn't appear in the report, please enter a whole node full. 
I'm encouraging you to try to use the HASE module and play a bit with the official example files stored in the Sophistic installation folder. Maybe you can use them together with the chapter 5 called Examples of the HASE manual, which describes and explains some of the above mentioned examples in detail. Finally, I would like to thank you for your attention and wish you good luck with Module HASE.